Good morning, everyone. I wanted to let you know that we just started recording for our, our general session. And thank you, Janice, for a wonderful welcome to the 2020 virtual mid-year Check and Connect. Our general session presenter is Bud Buckout. Bud Buckout is the director of the Inclusive Youth Program and associate director of the Tashoff Center at Syracuse University. He has worked in education for over 20 years. He earned his teaching certificate, his MS in special education, and a certificate of advanced studies from Lemoyne College. He has worked in exploring research and facilitation of groups to aid in the identification of students' instructional needs at the collegiate, district, and school level. He has implemented trainings at many educational levels to develop effective learning environments for students. I know that you're going to enjoy his presentation, which is titled, Building Financial Stability in Inclusive Higher Education Programs, colon, a framework. So at this time, please join me in welcoming Bud Buckout. And um, Bud, you should have the ability to share your screen. Welcome. Okay, great. Okay. We yes, we, we see the presentation, yes. <laughs> okay, so I'll give you a brief history of our inclusive youth program at Syracuse University. So Syracuse University has been a leader in uh, services for individuals for, for many, many, many years. And um, 1971 is when really the first formation started of the Center for Human Policy, uh, and that was by Doug Bicklin. And that began the process of uh, facilitated communication and investigation into that. Um, there's also individuals, Burton Blatt, Steve Taylor. And in 1999 is when we had our first collaboration and that was a dual enrollment program with the Syracuse City School District, uh, the on-campus program. And so students spend their day up at SU. And then in 2006, they started another collaboration called the Access Program. And that was with uh, adult human service agency in the area. And they had some individuals on their board whose children were graduating high school and wanted uh, to know if there were any options for them for college. And at that time, there wasn't a whole lot in Syracuse. Um, so they had contacted the agency SU, since one of the larger universities in the area. Uh, and the formation was started. So uh, that was through a Medicaid grant that the agency had. And so those both those programs continue today. In 2009 is when the Tayshaw Center was formed and it was very uh, small. And I'll explain a little bit later about that. And then in 2014, January is when we started Inclusive View. So we started out, the center started as a uh, research so the main goal was to see what is out there, what options are out there for individuals who are diagnosed with intellectual or developmental disability that want to go to college. What are the post-secondary options? So really it was to start that research uh, federally. So there was some uh, opportunities that the Institute had. Um, there's the Fund for Improvement for Post-Secondary Education, the FIPC. Uh, the NIDR, National Institute on Disability and Reorganization of Research. And then what was called the TIPSID, that began in 2010. And uh, we had applied in 2015. So there's some federal initiatives that we were able to take advantage of um, that helped us kind of design or look to where we needed to go. Um, we had, Tayshaw Center was started so that those options were there. Locally in New York State, we also had some opportunities as well um, through the assembly. We've had some representatives that have uh, been able to earmark some money, uh, although very small, still very helpful um, over the few past few years. Um, and then we had 
again, a Tayshaw Center was started by our funder, Rob Tayshaw, uh, in 2009, and he gave a major gift of $3 million. And so his main goal was to make sure that anyone who was diagnosed with that intellectual disability would have the opportunity to go to college. They would apply, um, just as anybody else. <clears throat> uh, the commitment was to, it would endow over time. Um, so we had that main branch of funding with the gift and then our tip -tip which stands for Transition Program for Intellectual Disability. Staffing. So we started out very small, and I guess to some degree we still are somewhat of a small staff, um, but the executive director was hired in 2009, and then they were there trying to organize, get that research set up, so they were working some grad students on campus, um, as well as writing some journal articles. And then in 2011, when we hired the assistant director for the Tayshaw Center, and what she had done was to work with the access program that was currently available and the on-campus program. And there was a grant that we were able to get from the federal government that wanted to see how technology could help an individual with intellectual disability. And so that's when we formed what was called the peer-to-peer -peer program. And so each student that was in the on-campus and access program was given a iPad and so the iPad was to be used on campus and at home, uh, however they wanted to use it. But with the idea of, as they're making connections to students socially with other students on campus, that they would have the ability to FaceTime or they have the ability to text each other. Um, the grant lasted for three years and the program peer-to-peer -peer was started then. Uh, and then in 2014, I was hired for the I was associate director of the Tayshaw Center and then the director for inclusive Youth. In 2015, we hired an internship coordinator because we kind of had the academic piece we thought on track. We had the socialization piece somewhat on track and we realized that students were wanting to know what does this mean when they leave college or when they graduate? Is there employment opportunity? So we were able to hire an inter internship employment coordinator. And then in 2016, we hired a student support specialist. And so his main job is to help on campus, but uh, to work with our residential students, students that are on campus. And then we have some various um, administrative assistants, some student workers uh, and mentors. And then we also have a director for communication and marketing. Okay, so financial structure. Uh, there are many different areas on campus we realized, and we still are, that um, when you're planning a program or starting a program, uh, you don't you necessarily know all the ins and outs. And so we, the students really needed to have the ability to be able to attend games. So our students, I'll go a little bit more detailed about the audit classes on campus. And with the designation, it gives them non-matriculated students. And so at Syracuse, which many institutions have, um, there are individuals and students who are not seeking a degree bearing certificate. And so in order for the students to be able to take part in many of the functions that were going on, for example, uh, basketball games, football games, um, the students needed to be able to pay the activity fee and we were unaware of that. Um, so without paying that, any student who's not does not pay that. Um, so we were able to negotiate some fees. So, so it's not a typical tuition aid model, not a business model, you know, what is it? So it really did start with these conversations on campus. And as we realized different factors, um, we had to make those situations work. Um, so that students' activity fees are paid for now. Students' health and wellness fees are paid for now. So uh, they can take advantage of counseling. They can take advantage of any of the services that are offered, um, the health clinic, um, attend games. And so then we have kind of what, what uh, was worked out. And then the structure really, um, we had some various grants, as I mentioned earlier, local, New York State, as well as some federal. And so we had to try to figure out how we were gonna marry the two as well as um, how were the students gonna then uh, pay for things that weren't covered in these grants. Um, so that we would be have the ability to move from grant, which is funding a lot of it to self-sustaining. Um, we really, it was realized that the, the Tayshaw Center needed to be set, um, that 
we needed a way to come up with to track the revenue uh, to track expenses that were uh, being made because we were kind of building it as we went um, <laughs> which is okay um, we had the end goal in mind and then we just had to kind of work backwards um, but we had to split up all the different areas so then we have Medicaid and we uh, students are using that they had and we have the grant funding um, operational expenses the gifts and endowments Uh, we also realized that where do we fit them? We had several different people located throughout campus. So the executive director of the Tisha Center was in one building. The uh, assistant director of the Tisha Center was in another building. I was in another building. Um, so we, what we did was the School of Education formed uh, us on uh, a floor with all the other um, departments on campus that would relate to disability services. So we were able to share administrative assistance. Um, we were all able to share you know, a copier, um, graduate assistant space. Uh, fortunately, the School of Education kind of thought ahead and realized that if everything was going to be successfully run, then we had to make a plan to make sure that everyone had what they needed to be able to do that. Okay. So the funding, I talked a little bit about it earlier. Um, I'll start from the beginning. So. In 2015, you can see this little graph here. 52% uh, was uh, from the gift that was given, that $3 million. And then uh, the university, what they were given. And then we, we bumped up then 2018 where the grant, what we were using for that was able to decrease a little bit. The, the gift, we were still able to use that and then the endowment as well. Uh, that's when we started to really get into using um, Medicaid. So in New York State, we have what's called self-direction and it's just the funding through Medicaid and many different states have similar uh, options, but Basically, the individual would apply for what's called self-direction, and it gives them the opportunity to choose what they would want to do uh, with a pot of money that they're given. Um, so the Medicaid realized that there are a lot of middlemen kind of involved. So if someone wanted to go to um, a, 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 like a different program, then they had to wait for an opportunity to just open in that program, then they could apply, um, like a day bulletin. So they said, well, let's give this person a choice. What would they want to do? So they meet with a broker, they develop a budget, and in that budget is the ability to pay for tuition and community classes. And so that's where we saw an increase, which really helped the sustainability. So in-kind support, School of Education, initially, uh, we see, so we have our budget office, uh, HR, billing, grant proposals. So we're able to use everybody that is in there to make sure that the program, again, has the same opportunities that any other department on campus has. If the student is enrolled in inclusive view, that they have the same opportunity that other students have um, space. Okay. So student revenue. So they're charged a tuition. So the tuition is whatever the audit rate is. I mentioned earlier, students audit passes on campus. So the students will build into their budget the tuition. So if they're taking two one credit classes and two three credit classes, then that would be billed to the student. Um, the way Medicaid had set up was that um, you can't, an individual can't submit or get reimbursed for something until it's been completed. So when I mentioned we work with different departments, this is one area that we had to really work with the bursar registration so that we could set up billing so that the student could register for classes, but then pay for it at the end of the term. Um, transition fees. So this is a, also involved a budget line. And so what Medicaid recommended was uh, you can apply to be a transition program. And so with that, you can charge a monthly uh, amount. And so we do that as well. And that's covered on the person's budget. So it's nothing out of pocket for them for tuition or transition fees. Um, support services. So that would be the hiring of somebody to help them on campus. Um, Medicaid College is a community rehabilitation specialist. We call it a campus mentor, um, but that helps uh, them on campus. We work with the Office of Services. Uh, 
housing and dining. So we're working with housing, dining with the students who are living in the dorms, then need to go through the process of using their budget that will help a little bit towards room and board. Um, but that is one of the only expenses right now that the student has to pay out of pocket. Inclusionist program into the university is similar to inclusion of our students in the university. So what we wanted to make sure was, again, that everything that was occurring was the same for everybody on campus. So educating, advocating, improvising, adapting. So like I mentioned before that you know, sometimes you don't know something until you know it. So with that student activity team, so we didn't know. So we were able to work that out. Um, it's educating the campus as a whole. This is inclusive view. This is what we do. The students will like to uh, you know, audit your class. So we make sure the professors are on board. They're well aware in the beginning that a student wants to audit the class. What is the expectation for them? Um, you know, the student will have support in the classroom. Um, advocating, so helping the students learn to advocate for themselves, um, which for many, this is the first time they've had to do that. And then also for parents. Uh, they're the ones who are advocating for the child. So we work with the parents too and helping them take a step back and how they can support their student in a different way now that they're in college. Um, improvising, and sometimes it's on the fly. Sometimes we don't hear of something um, until it's occurring. So then we we'll figure out what's the best way to move forward and adapting. Um, we started what was called a seminar. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But uh, we would talk to the students during the semester and say, what are some things that maybe you want to learn more about uh, that you think you could benefit from? And so the seminars were offered once a week, uh, at least one a day, and they last about 45 minutes to an hour. And they range in topics. So the students, we realized that they need to have this information to be successful on campus. Um, so we had started some initial ones where they could use uh, videos and pictures for self-advocacy. Um, financial literacy. Um, we have one that is required for all the students who are living in the dorms on healthy sex and date. So we're just continually trying to see what is needed and then move from there. Um, so University College is our part-time studies program, adult continuing education. And so that seemed to make the most sense to where to house, um, to go to for registration for classes because they deal with the non-traditional students. Um, and it seemed to make the most sense. So they have proven to be an invaluable partner. Um, I mentioned before about the billing. So for example, in some discussions with the director, uh, when we were first starting back in uh, 2014, end of 2013, um, we realized that uh, the Medicaid aspect where they can't get reimbursed or uh, paid for something until it's completed. So the university realized that back in the, when the Vietnam War ended and military was coming back, they had something in place that was called direct bill. So the individuals who were using that would come in from the military, they would register for classes and the government was billed at the end of the semester. And so the director for birth registration said, well, we can do the same thing for your students then. There's no reason why they can't follow this, it just hasn't been used. So we realized a lot of paths that were kind of in place, but um, hadn't been used in years. And um, so that was a great opportunity for our students to be able to do that what was happening prior was when students were having to uh, bring the money up front and pay for the classes they wanted to take, which in some cases really limited the number of classes. They could take. Initially, students were taking maybe one class a semester and they started bumping up to two or three or four. Um, but now that every student had the means to do that. So this was a nice way to hold off. So then it was billed directly to the Medicaid and the students weren't having to pay for it up front. Um, we work with uh, student academic services. So the students will see the university college advisors um, to meet, discuss classes. Um, and so it was, it, they've just been invaluable as far as helping guide us to where we needed to go um, because we're not experts in this area and they are. Okay, so human resources, this, I'm just so proud of what Syracuse did when it came to this. So way back uh, in 2013, I believe it was, um, we had a professor contact us that um, had a question. They had a child who 
was Medicaid eligible. And the way things were set up with limited tuition was you had to be matriculated dependent in order to take advantage of that. So we started the conversations with human resources. And what they did at that time was, so they thought um, eight courses over four years to the number of credit hours needed. So what that means is uh, students will look to a certain area of concentration. So whether it's gerontology, it could be sports management, it could be jewelry and metal smithing. So they'll look to those classes and they'll choose at least five of the core classes. And those are the, they have to take at least those five to earn their non credit certificate. And so this was built in then for students who were going to use their parents' dependent or limited tuition. They could take two classes a semester for four, uh, or one class a semester for four years. And it was uh, helped them to go work towards that certificate. And then, so developing friends across campus. So we, our students really uh, worked hard to explore their interests and where does that match up? Um, we had several students who, uh, you know, if you see Harry's video, you'll know that he was able to start working with the men's basketball team. And that just opened up so many doors. So really, a lot of times it was just uh, asking the right question to the right person, uh, which sometimes is trial and error, uh, but you get there. So we realized that everything we were doing doesn't necessarily fit into what is currently in place at SU. Um, and so we had to figure out what we needed to do to maximize any potential opportunities that were out there. Uh, the CTP designation, so Certified Transition Program. So we started the process of becoming a Certified Transition Program with the federal government and we were approved. And so that really helped the students have a little more opportunity. So a lot of times we uh, had students who were pretty much local or within maybe 45 minutes to an hour drive of the campus, uh, pretty much commuter students. And then as the years started to move on, we had students who were out of state interested in coming to Syracuse. And so if they did not want to transfer their benefits in your state, then they weren't able to use the self-direction benefits for Medicaid. So then how else were they going to pay? So we had that private pay option, but also with this the designation, all of our students when they applied as true and accepted, they fill out the FAFSA. So we want to see what opportunities as far as financial are available to them. And again, we work with the University College, excuse me, and their financial aid department. And the director works really hard at making sure that everything's in place. If the family's confused, they sit down with them and help upload documents, go through the documents, so that the student can have a really good picture, a financial picture of what's expected of them uh, for each semester. Um, we We'll have, we currently have um, three students who are out of state. And then this next fall, we have, I believe, four more coming in. So it's really starting to move and we're seeing an increase as far as the number of applicants that are out of state. Um, internships, we weren't really sure. So again, we wanted to have the students have some background uh, with work uh, in the workforce. And so we started out with uh, the project search model, and that was wonderful. It really helped us um, you know, have the students get a lot of different opportunities. So for the first three years, they're taking classes, and then uh, they're doing the internships. We've since then shifted uh, because we realized the model was challenging for us in the post-secondary level. Um, so we switched to just from three 10-week internships to two 15-week internships. Um, and we have structured a little bit different, but we worked very closely with VR um, throughout that last senior semester and uh, in the fall and the spring to uh, make it so that hopefully by the time the student graduates, uh, there's employment. And currently we are at 100% um, with the graduates who graduate uh, in May to find employment. Uh, so we're pretty proud of that. And SU has hired um, many students as well. We just wanted to have them have the ability to apply just as any other student would. Um, so I forgot to uh, mention certain human resources. So what we did was we revisited this in um, 
two years ago. Because as we had students living on campus, as students were taking more and more classes, uh, we realized that uh, they were taking more than possibly one class. Um, so what SU did was uh, they rewrote policy. And so with the remitted tuition benefit, any uh, faculty or staff that has that ability, their dependents can uh, take it's a, whatever number of credits that will make it so that they can graduate uh, during their four years. So it, for their first three years of academics, all those courses that are required for their certificate, as well as the internship. Um, and so that's pretty huge at, uh, for SU to be able to do that. So dorm living. So we were able to open up the option for students to live in the dorm. Uh, and again, that was one of those conversations we had. Matriculated students on the books at SU, you have to matriculate students to live in the dorm. So fortunately, we had heard of a relationship that uh, there was a university um, in Brazil that had some students come up here during the summertime. And so they were allowed to live in the dorms. And so they were not matriculated students. And we said, well, if they were able to take advantage of this, is that possible then for other groups? So SU was able to write in a policy that if you're in the inclusivity program as a non matriculated student, you can have the ability to live in the dorm. Uh, so we were able to do that. So currently, uh, Medicaid is, uh, they have all these different safeguards that are put in place that, so that individuals can uh, make sure that they're safe. Um, for instance, you know, a lease. Um, well, we don't have a lease, so the students will sign a you know, document saying that they're agreeing to live in the dorm for this academic period. So we're working with Medicaid to be able to say, well, what needs to be in place? Our, is it our language? Is it your language? So that a student may use their budget to pay for this. Um, you know, if you're in an apartment building, you have access to a stove right there in your apartment, uh, you know, your full refrigerator. So there's no stove or in, in, your, in your dorm room. So where are those located? Are there in the dorms in the residential hall? So they are. So again, working out that language and so they were able to start a pilot with us. Um, so a certain student can use a certain portage of their housing allowance uh, to pay for their room. And then with the, the meal plan, they were able to use the, some of their budget to pay for that as well, uh, which is uh, a big turn uh, and shift kind of. And Medicaid has a lot of uh, protocols in place. And so they're working with those to see what that shift would look like, as well as uh, SU. So they've been working together with Pesco for years to make that uh, more of a reality for students. Um, so residential mentor, this was a huge piece. Um, so we wanted to make sure that the students were supportive in every area on campus. So I mentioned that they hire somebody to be with them, uh, campus mentor. So they're there with, uh, you know, going on the, in the classroom with them, helping them take notes, learning how to do that. Well, that needed to be in place too for the residential aspect. So what we're able to find out with Medicaid is they have, um, we call them residential mentors. So they have what's called a living caregiver or a paid neighbor, and the student is able to use the budget to help pay for that person. So the residential mentor, in a sense, is the student's roommate. And so what our residential student support coordinator does is they will hold interviews with matriculated students who are interested in being a residential mentor, a roommate. And then once they're in place, they will meet with the families of the students who are uh, going to be living in the dorm, and then they have the ability to student to interview uh, potential students to see who's going to be a good fit. And we let them know that you know sometimes do the best you can. Uh, and share experiences of my first roommate, um, and we didn't necessarily be the best. We weren't the best match, so we were able to uh, move around. Um, but the what was interesting is to see, um, I guess, the shift from uh, the students going to be living in the dorm. A lot of them hadn't uh, really been away from home that much. They may have gone to a summer camp or a relative. So to see a shift of you know, somewhat nervousness to then, oh, someone will be there and I can put a face to that name before I show up the first day uh, was nice. Um, and it was helpful for the family to know that uh, as far as finances go, some of it was going to be covered. So that support covered in full. That's not like the room and board that we have to pay. Um, so 
so additional support so that first point of contact for the, the student that may be having a question or an issue is their uh, roommate, residential mentor. That residential mentor is also helping them on campus and for that 24 seven support. So where do I go if, if, you know, if I'm not here, what do you need to do? Um, so they are there working for the, maybe the uh, RA. So the RA is being trained in how to um, help handle situations or questions for the student if the residential mentor is not there. Um, there's an agreement worked out with a residential mentor uh, so that the student feels completely comfortable. So it might be, um, you know, I really need you to be sure that you're there in exchange for your room being paid for. You know, can you please be there Sunday through Thursday from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And then, you know, I think I'm okay on these other two days or I need you to help me set up my alarms in the Alexa for my needs. Um, you might need to take uh, medication. You might need to, you know, if you're eight class, first class is eight o'clock, you know, set alarm for 6.30 to get up. And then your next alarm is to get to the dining hall to get grab some breakfast real quick. Um, so that's what that residential mentor is there for. Um, we realized that more support was needed. So we have that residential mentor that's there. And then, uh, for example, we need to be more available and cover more time, um, develop the fee structure depending on needs, charge the campus. So the person is able to hire various campus mentors maybe to help them with different aspects on the campus. So one might be help them just navigate from classes. They're gonna handle just a class aspect. Another one might be with them to help uh, with homework um, or to be able to go from you know, South Campus to North Campus. What's the travel train on the bus? How to get there the best way? Um, it could be, you know, hey, if you're on campus and for some reason you're not uh, sure what you need to do, here are some places you can go to get um, what you need or direct you to where you need to go. Um, you know, we have check-ins with the students. There's a few of us around, and as well as our campus mentors, and we don't hear from someone for a day or two. And we can shoot them a quick text and find out what's going on. Um, but we wanted to make sure that this family had a clear understanding of what was expected of them financially. And then with those expectations, very clearly write out who's responsible for that. And again, within New York State, we're very, very fortunate that we have self-direction. So that pays for absolutely everything that the individual may need on campus with the exception of room and board and full. And then any extra curriculum activities as well as uh, you know, food for lunchtime. Opening more doors. Uh, so again, we're no longer limited to those who are just living in New York State. Um, we have students from across the country, like on the farthest right now being California. Uh, and then we have a student who is living in Washington that's going to be coming in the fall. So more and more and more students are coming, which is good. Um, but it also brings about that, you know, if you build it, they will come. Well, they've come in force, and we're at the point now where we have a wait list every year, um, which I hate having. Um, but it's just like any other student that comes to, you know, applies to the college, they may or may not get in, they accept it right away. Okay, so financial aid, um, again, working with University College, they are are experts in handling not traditional students. So then that process that um, the director walks each student through is just wonderful. It helps the parents because they're trying to understand and figure out best you know, how are they going to pay for this? Are they taking out private loans if they're out of state? Um, if they're in state, you know, again, the room and board is only covered a little bit. So where is that additional coming from? Um, we found that as we uh, started requiring the students to fill out the FAFSA that um, it takes a lot of the I guess, pressure off of us because what we were finding initially was, you know, oh, I really want the student here. It was great. So we would accept them. And then uh, initially we started using, well, we have the grant, right? We had the tips. So we can use some of that money to help pay for this or that. And then uh, we realized, you know, from year one that we have to make sure that we're self-sustaining. This is the charge that was given from my chancellor. Any department on campus has to be self-sustaining. So it really helped us to be able to say, okay, if you're filling out the FAFSA, uh, you know, we have your application, we've interviewed you. Next step is the FAFSA. 
then you can see where you're at, just like any other student applies to the campus. So then they're able to go, again, as I mentioned before, you know, the director will lay out a very clear picture of what's expected and financially, who's going to pay for what, whether it's, um, you know, they're able to participate in, you know, be, be a, a student worker, or whether it's going to be just a mini grant from the college, or, you know, what is being covered under their self-direction budget. So that really, really helped us um, and take the pressure off. They say you're accepted and then they can decide whether it's a good fit for them financially and if they need to be there. We've really tried to make sure that as we've moved along and as we've grown from you know, 2014 when we had maybe 10 students to this past year we had 83 students, um, that we've made sure that every place um, we've kind of taken a step back and we've had conversations with students, we've had conversations with departments. Um, you know, when I mentioned earlier about the health and wellness students and activity fee, um, you know, the students aren't uh, taking in everything, so that's why we were able to negotiate a good fee um, to pay for them. And again, it, covered, it can come out of their budget, so they're not responsible for it, but again, it allows them the ability to be able to attend anything that any other student can attend. Um, and so you don't necessarily know until you start to, at least we found that, grow of what exactly is going to be needed. Um, but what uh, advice I try to always give is you know, map out what you need to do, <laughs> what you want to do, and then try to figure out how is that going to work. And some of the dreams or the ideas or you know, the needs may have to be prioritized so that you can make sure that it's going to be successful. Um, you know, that our chips of grant sunsets this year. You know, so we've made sure that we look at all the different, uh, I guess, opportunities we're able to use, uh, use that money for from that grant, federal grant. And then we've kind of looked then at what's coming in with the student, with the self direction budget and other things with the FAFSA. And we've realized that, you know, we are so self sustaining without that grant. Now, does that mean we're not going to apply for grants? No, I mean, we're going to apply for everything we can apply for and the ability to use that money. Um, which is so interesting with that technology grant I mentioned in the beginning uh, back in 2011 that was started uh, with a peer-to-peer -peer. and that just it bundled it went from you know hey how's this technology going to help someone with international disability uh, socialize to I mean, the students are using that iPad now every student gets an iPad every freshman that comes in and that's what they're using a lot of times when they're on a go on campus they're pulling up what they need for Blackboard information. They're pulling up their Bursar account if they have a question. Um, and so they're using that as a tool that's helping them be successful. And so that wouldn't have been there without that little grant that we had in the beginning. Um, but it helped us then say, okay, how do we use this information that we learned from this grant? Um, so self-sustaining is, is huge for us. Uh, we want to make sure that we are in a position for that. The internships. So the students are, again, those three years of academics, taking a minimum of five classes in whatever core area, and then a lot of different electives um, within that. And if they want to take more than five, they're certainly welcome to. Um, so we really worked hard with the departments to have them kind of plan ahead of time what those classes might be potentially. And that's helped us a great deal um, because some of the higher level classes, um, 300, 400s, that are usually set aside for um, you know, that major, that matriculated student. We're realizing now that students are being invited to uh, audit those classes because of the work that they've done, which then led us to this ability for different internships on campus. So, if, and with the internships, we realized that, you know, our students do 20 hours a week, nine through Friday, so four hours a day at the actual internship. Well, some students were coming through taking the classes. We realized the first year we started this 20 hour a week internship, that it was kind of a shock to them. They hadn't done volunteer maybe for that number of hours before or had a job that had that number of hours before. So what we did was we started with their freshman year. The opportunity is there for maybe freshman year to do a three to five hour a week internship. Sophomore year, maybe a you know, five to eight to 10 hour internship. Junior year, 10 to 15 hours. And then at senior year, 20 hours. Uh, that's what the student would like. They're on and off campus. Um, we've tried to align the coursework. So those, those five, four courses. So if it's in um, maybe music production, 
that's where a student sees themselves going for a career, then we want to make sure that those classes they took align with the internship they're taking. And so that first one on or off campus, we had one student who was really, he uh, was learning the soundboard at his church. He loved that. Um, that's where he wanted to go. So he was able to do his first internship at a local uh, recording studio. And he was learning how to, the bands would come in, they would do live sessions, they'd be recorded. So he was learning the software that they would use for that, all the ins and outs. Um, we didn't have anything on campus that could do that. So that's where we had to move off campus. And it was very successful. Um, so then he realized that he wanted a little more information on the different softwares that were available and what that could be. So then uh, we were able to have him do a second internship in what we call the makerspace, a 3D printer. Um, because he was realizing that, well, we, you know, they have the graphics that you normally associate with a, a record album, or, and then there's other things that the student could do with that. So that was really neat to see. Um, we have, uh, we asked the departments not to just create busy work, but they look at uh, different positions that they have in that department, and the students would, would do that. Um, it's not paid currently. Um, so they take two different classes. The first class is the actual kind of class time, hands-on, so it's the, and we call them interns, but they would come in the morning, about 45 minutes, and they're going over soft skills, they're going over um, appropriate dress for you're working in the dome, as opposed to if you're working in the school of business, um, you know, who do you contact for uh, if you're sick one day? Um, working out the, you know, the job coaches in there who they contact. So those are all things that are talked about in class time, which is before the internship and then about a half hour or 30 minutes in the afternoon at the internship. So that's one uh, class that's four and a half credits. And then the other class is the actual internship. And so, apologize. Um, so with this alignment we have with vocational rehab, they are paying for the job coaching, um, which is great. Uh, that helps cut costs as well. And then the core year also is helping with that. Um, it's paid through Medicaid additional year funding. Um, and it does help with the CTP requirements that, uh, that we have. So we have worked really hard to make sure that it's there. Okay, grand plans. So we're realizing now we're uh, we started 2014, we're now in 2020. And the Tasha Center really consists of research branch and then um, inclusive view branch uh, as part of it. And so we want to do more and more research. So we're trying to look at what else is available out there. Um, you know, we're looking at all these different options, you know, federal funding applications, uh, state grants, foundations for support. Um, and then what the School of Education did was they established a center on disability and inclusion. So we're on a floor where any, any uh, center department that deals with uh, disability inclusion is on that floor, which was really a smart move by the dean um, that we will all be able to use each other. As I mentioned before, you know, share a copy or administrative assistant. Well, it's a little bit more than that, really when it comes down to it, because sometimes there's questions. We continually are helping each other there as a, uh, you know, a, a group that, a department that works with, um, you know, that K-12 special education. And so we're able to now help students uh, write the transition goal for IT in their junior, senior year. Uh, more students. So we are currently now accepting cohorts of 25. Uh, so we will have 100 students that are coming in, which we kind of use that funding line of self-direction. So their budgets are paying for their classes there. And then the on-campus program that I mentioned, um, they were right around seven students a year and they're being bumped up to about 12 this fall. And the access program that I mentioned earlier, they're around seven. So you have close to 20 students there. So we'll be between 105, 15, 120 students in this fall. Uh, and again, it's just really helped Kind of blaze that trail for inclusive higher education. Um, you know, we are able to do a lot of technical assistance. Um, you know, this is what we learned. These are the mistakes we made. These are the you know, decisions we thought would be helpful, and they were. Or this is what we had to do then. Um, you know, really try to break things down again to make sure that it's self-sustaining. 
we want to make sure that we had all the different opportunities available that again any student on campus would have. Um, you know, we one thing that was really neat. This really doesn't deal with financial, uh, but um, we have the it was Pan Am 103, uh, it was Tech back in the 80s, and um, Lockerbie scholarships. That was for matriculated students who would apply for this scholarship. And so what they did was every student that unfortunately passed in that attack is remembered every single year. And so a matriculated student will apply, and then they will represent that student who passed. And so this year we actually had a student who was um, in our program but applied for it. And as a non-matriculated student, he was accepted. So it was, a, it was kind of another barrier that was not broken down, but we just didn't know about it until he was like, what is this about? And so we were to find out more information. And so we had another student that she was applying for an extra year. So you just don't know uh, what the opportunities are until you hear of them. And so we are trying to, uh, as, as best we can, but we're on a campus with 22,000 full and part-time students. Sometimes you don't always hear that. So we're constantly trying to get out there, and ask questions and find out what opportunities are available. Um, you know, recruit more out-of-state students. So we are, we had our largest number this year apply. Um, and it's really exciting to see uh, the potential student go through your process and then to really follow up afterwards. I'm very excited. I'm just curious, you know, what does this mean? And help parents work through that as well. You know, some of them are a little uneasy sending their child across the country. Um, some have had those conversations uh, and are, are ready to go. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it was just, it's really nice now that we have everything in place so that um, we're saying, yep, hey, here, this is what, uh, you know, you're accepting the program. Now you have to meet with financial aid to find out what, you know, what's going on, just like any other student. Uh, what is our tipping point? I think we're right about where we need to be right now as far as the number of staff that we have. Um, you know, we want to make sure that it's quality, that uh, you know, we were not necessarily so concerned with quantity. Um, but again, as the years have passed, we've realized that we can do a little bit more than we used to do cohorts of 12, and now it's 25. Okay, so new avenues, so orientation, we realized that we really needed to make sure that um, we were just as involved with orientation as each of these students. So fortunately, on the campus, each different school that's there has their own orientation, so we were able to have our orientation. And then they all intermix within the campus as a whole. So there's certain things that the students are learning that pertain just to them, what they may need as a school of education student, and then how does that transfer into campus as a whole. Um, so we have a two-day orientation and the students will go through that and then it'll look a little bit different this year. Uh, but in the past, what would happen was you know, the students would go through orientation and that Friday evening, they'd be a big convocation for the chancellor would welcome all the students. And so our students will participate just as any other Michigan students and go to the dome and be involved in that ceremony. Um, online offerings, so those have increased <laughs> with this current uh, new normal we're in right now. But, um, pardon me. <coughs> but we had our first online student start this past year. So she is distance learning, lives in Washington, DC, and she, uh, we're working with uh, some classes that aren't used to doing online as far as accessibility to remotely view in. Um, and so she's able to do that and earn her degree online. Um, the, again, the out-of-state students educators, current educators. So we're working really hard to make sure that communication is there with the professors that are involved, um, that they feel the support they need, that they have in place what they need. One of the nice things about uh, the audit is that it does give some freedom. For example, um, you know, for a professor, you know, we had one professor who just did four multiple choice tests. That was the assessment that was done in the class. And it was a smaller class. It was 12 students. We had a student take that class and um, she had a real change in time with multiple, uh, multiple choice. And so we, she did have, uh, was gifted an area of art. And so she asked if she could do a diorama um, based on the questions from the exam. And so what the professor saw was that she was putting in so much information that, she, that the professor wasn't even asking for that was being answered. And well, um, that she shifted how she did the, the class. She was pretty much lecture based, um, which, needed to be for the most part, but then she realized, well, I can build in some discussion time 
It doesn't take away from anything, but it might add so the students have a little more value. And she realized she did. So she would do some lectures a little bit, and then the students had a chance to talk and dialogue and ask questions after that conversation, which really helped her. And then she ended up offering you know, some academic choice. So it wasn't just multiple choice questions, but it was uh, another option for students who may have needed that. So that was great just to see the, the shift. And I, and I think that's it. <laughs> so are there, are there any questions? I kind of threw a lot out there. But we, we have got several questions in the chat box that I will start with. But first, thank you. Wow, I've learned so much more about Inclusive You and um, certainly your experience with the program is evident in the way that you can, um, in the way that you um, share this rich history of Inclusive You. And then um, your most, the employment, you know, your recent graduates at 100% employment. I mean, you, you're doing things, you're definitely doing things right. Um, so we will start with some of the questions. And um, one of the first is from Amanda. And she said the activity and health fees were added to the students tuition to pay or covered by private funds. So that is added to the bursar bill. And then it's so then it's under the, the tuition. And so it's paid for out of the student self direction budget. And then those who students who do not uh, live in New York State are using New York State benefits, self-direction, private paid, so still in their bursar bill. So all the fees now for the students are added to their bursar bill in the beginning of the year on their to-do list. Okay. All right. And I think the next question on the numbers you've talked about that you have um, usually 25 students and that you... Yeah, we moved yeah, from 12 to 20 to 25. <laughs> and Go ahead. What is, um, what's the current relationship between this program and the Disability Services Office? We have an incredible relationship with them, fortunately. Um, they've been involved since day one. We wanted to make sure that the students were allowed to access everything that mature students were allowed to. So the students at orientation, they sign up, they fill out the questionnaire uh, for Disability Services, and then um, they're assigned a counselor and then they work with them. And then what we do is, so they have a, a questionnaire that's filled out you know, uh, and we have the students use their IEPs to help generate the accommodations that they think are needed. Um, and then the office works with the students and letting the professors know and they do the same thing that they do with all the students who are applying to uh, use those services. So the letter is sent to the professor, here's the accommodations the students will be using. And then uh, we ask them if we could work with them and take it a step farther and so at advising what our students do um, is they fill out um, a form with the syllabus they get and so then it really breaks down all the assignments and readings and the student says this is what I want to try to accomplish it's kind of a fluid document that's not set in stone so then the counselor has signs off on it the professor signs off on it, the student signs off on it and then we'll sign off on it if the student may say I want to try all the assignments as written and that's the way we start where they may say i'm not going to do any tests or quizzes but i'll do the discussion questions and i'll do um you know the papers uh so the office based services has been incredibly helpful uh in helping making sure that all the resources they have are available to our students thank you next question can you discuss the process of adding graduate assistance to your office um <clears throat> well fortunately with the tipster grant we had uh, that helped pay for a uh, graduate system every year. So now uh, I don't handle that area, but we're making sure now that we can write that in so that we have that ability every year. Um, and so the peer to peer program I mentioned earlier, like for example, that was uh, run by one of our staff members. The, she was the assistant director of the care center. Now the GA ran it last year and she did a phenomenal job uh, because she's on the ground running, you know, knows the campus, knows those students. Um, so, but we're also trying to say, well, geez, if that's not gonna work then if that's not in a the budget, then how do we meet that need? So we are able to use some student workers too. And so we've been using them as well. Great. What are the estimated cost per student for each of um, the categories, looking at tuition, transition fees, support services, Mm -hmm. housing and dining. Do you have those? Uh, 
I can give some estimates. So okay. some estimates and some uh, ones that are set. So the tuition ranges, we um, recommend that a student will put in their budget then about 4,000 a semester for classes. Currently it is uh, $417 for uh, one credit audit. And so that's what we use. So if a student is doing a one credit phys ed class, say for example, they wanna take two of them, then there is you know, a little over uh, $800. Right. And then if they're taking a three credit or two or three credits, then uh, it's 1251 for a three credit. So then that bumps up to about 3000. So we say around 4000 is probably a good um, per semester. And then the transition fees are set so that they're set by Medicaid. And so uh, they're based on 24 months, the first 24 months of the student in the program. And we currently don't have summer um, opportunities. And so we're hoping to next year. So it's just a 10 month. So that's 4000 a semester that's set. So we have them set that in there. Um, and then the support services, we help them try to figure out, um, all the students get a mock schedule. You know, hey, here's what is kind of the day in the life. And we include uh, it being in the residence halls, whether they're gonna live on campus or not, just so they can get an idea. Um, and so we break down where they might need hours. Uh, and then, so we try to help them come up with costs that would be associated with that. Um, and then we have the housing dining is set um, housing depends on the room they're in. And so some students might be in a single, um, most of them are in a double. We did have this past year, um, which is very rare, um, but we had three students who wanted to room together. Uh, so they, so we got a suite. So they had one residential mentor for those three students, but generally the students are split up into different category or learning communities that's called on campus. Um, so it just depends on what room you're in and what that looks like for that. And then the meal plan, uh, we work through them and just determine, you know, how many they want. Do they want, there's like seven, 14, 21, and 28. So it depends on the number of times you want to go. Um, okay. So that, that varies. It's around maybe 16,000 for a room and board at the most basic level. Um, so that's built in there as well. And again, those, those are all costs that the director of financial aid is able to go over with them. And then they get aligned to any grants or aids from the university as well as the FAFSA. Okay. Is um, self-direction a Medicaid waiver program? So yes, it's one of the funnies, yeah, that uh, Medicaid allows. Um, Medicaid won't uh, reimburse or pay for a credit bearing class. So uh, that's one of the reasons why we do audit as well, um, besides the fact of being able to help that student discover their learning style. Um, it would take credit. So the students can take a credit class. Um, we had one student so far that, that has done that. And we will keep them more closely with us Disability Services. Um, right now it's the Center for uh, Disability Resource uh, starting this fall. Um, but to make sure, because they have to follow, you know, just any other student that's taking a class for credit. So we have to make sure that they're gonna be successful. And I didn't mention this, but one of our kind of, I guess, innovation or next steps is um, we're able to start this fall with kind of a hybrid. So we have a student who's gonna be coming in, um, is gonna take classes, gonna do his first semester audit in the fall. And then the spring is gonna take some credit classes as well as the audit. And then wants to try to apply to a school on campus for his next year as a matriculated student. So we're trying to navigate through that and see how that would work. Um, I apologize, I did forget to mention that um, with the campus, students are eyeing the class. So whatever department or school that had the class, so if it was um, gerontology in fall, they would get a certain percentage of uh, the tuition that the student was paying. Um, and it was being able to work out with the deans of our college that um, that amount of money, that percentage comes back to the school of vacation. Now it doesn't go to the instructor in the school that they come from. Okay, thank you for sharing that. I, um, sorry. No, no, no. Next, our next question is, was about um, non-credit or credit classes. And I think you've sort of just, just answered that. Um, do yeah. students graduate with a professional cert, with professional certifications? So yeah, so the students have their campus mentors that help them and then we help them on campus uh, in the classes. And then the students graduate with a non-credit certificate. So that was another thing that University College they would have let us know that um, back when, um, they had a lot of uh, non-credit certificates that were offered. 
and they said a lot of them happened to be when kind of women were entering the workforce they had stenography or they had different ones like that so we were able to use that that was kind of non-existent but still in the books um, so that's what our stu students do they take those five minimum five classes and that's in that non-credit certificate and then we incorporate their internship into that as well so there's it's not a credit variance certificate and that's kind of the you know, I'm still trying to figure out how that might work someday. Um, but currently it's a non-credit certificate from the School of Education. Okay, all right, thank you. Do students pay student activity fees? So they're paid for through, uh, that's one of the things that come out of the uh, transition fees. Um, but so any supplies the student made for campus, but we pay their student activity fee as well as the health and wellness fee. And again, it was working with um, that office to kind of negotiate what that would look like. Um, so yes, uh, it comes out of their budget. It's not out of pocket for them. How are students included in the general student activities, student-led clubs, and student government leadership? So every year in the beginning of the semester, they have, uh, we have what's called a quad, a large open grassy area, and all the different activities and um, clubs meet they, they have tables and so they can describe what they offer, what they do, and the students will go and apply just as any other student will. Um, that is how we found out about that Lockerbie scholarship. Um, they have what's called Idlethon every year and that's where it's like a dance marathon for 12 hours. So money's raised for, it's a local children's hospital. And we had a student who actually was in that hospital as a baby, as a toddler. Um, he had cancer and his so he felt he owed a lot to that. So he wanted to get involved in that. And he is, for the past years, was a top uh, raiser. So they're spread out through all the different clubs and activities on campus. We haven't had a student yet who wanted to apply for government student leadership, but uh, you never know. <laughs> Great. Is it required for students to be enrolled in Medicaid, VR, and or FAFSA to be admitted into the program? Uh, so no. Um, we kind of have that one funding stream and it's in self-direction then we have their private pay so if someone did not have medicaid or choose not to use medicaid then they would be in the private uh, pay area so that would transfer over um we don't require every student to fill out the fafsa but uh, we let them know that if they don't they might be missing out on some opportunities to have to pay for different things so um you know the what 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 is nice and what we try to let the students know is if they are receiving some money from the FAFSA and they can increase some other areas of the budget that they weren't using toward education, uh, which sometimes students have a pretty tight budget. So that, that helps. That can go towards room and board. And that really helps some students realize, oh, then this might be attainable. So that 16,000 is dropping even more if I'm able to get $2,000 from uh, the government. <laughs> right. How many graduates have you had? Um, let's see. We have had, well, last year we had 13. The year before, I think we had 10. Because um, we were building up to that um, from when we first started. So this year we'll have, this next year we'll have 20. Okay. On an average, um, how many mentors will a student have and how will the parents know how much it might cost since those costs are charged to parents? Uh, so it really depends. Um, most students have maybe one that they uh, handle on campus. However, the students who live in the dorms, they generally have maybe three, two or three. And then they have a range of what they're allowed to pay that person out of their budget. So we do offer the ability that if someone doesn't use an a, a local agency for their support, um, we can hire uh, a mentor that would work with them. Uh, it's set up for up to 10 hours a week and up to 20 hours a week and then up to 40 hours a week. Okay. Regardless of the funding source for the student, do you require the family pay tuition fees up front and then they are reimbursed for those costs through those various sources if qualified, such as Medicaid, financial aid, VR? Um, no, so nothing's paid up front. Um, I just want to make sure I understand the question. Right, that's, it's, it's over in the chat. It's in the, um, but it's our, Carol, do you want to expound on that a little? 
Hey bud, this is Carol from the University of Georgia. Um, it was basically, I'm wondering, um, do your families pay each semester or at the start of the semester or following your university tuition uh, payment schedule? And then if they qualify for um, funding through those various sources, such as Medicaid, VR, uh, or federal financial aid, do they then just, do the reimbursements go to the family or do you receive payments from those sources directly and manage that on behalf of the student? Okay. Um... So the, all the tuition and fees are put on the student's birth year account in the beginning of the semester, and then nothing is expected as far as payment until the end of the semester, as, as far as for what Medicaid may be paying. Um, again, because they won't reimburse or pay for anything that is toast completed. So that's why we're able to do that so students can register. And then it's been worked out then so that um, they fill out, I think it's a W, it might be the W-9, but um, we sent a bill to the student so they know what they're being charged, even though it's on their account in the beginning of the semester. And then to, in this case, through Medicaid self-direction is fiscal intermarry, the FI, and the bill is sent to them. And then it's directly sent to us. So the student doesn't have to pay for anything. It's all done through the agency that they work with. And then if it's private pay for some reason, like the student from uh, you know out of state, then they're able to still go through the process of um, signing up for classes, registering for classes, but then they split the, up to the payment plan that might be there or pay in full. So that would, if you're out of state, it transfers over to what a material student would do if they were um, setting up a payment plan and this, if they were gonna pay for everything up front. Does that help? And then please contact me if you have any more questions regarding that, Carol, and we can talk more about it. Okay, next question. What are the eligibility admission requirements for your program? So uh, we asked if the students are uh, Medicaid eligible with that uh, diagnosis of intellectual or developmental disability. And then they just have to be able to follow the student code of conduct. So the student, uh, what we found was that a lot of students um, either had challenges in high school uh, and decided to leave, or they made it through, but it really um, helped them have more of a negative outlook on some academics. And so we took away the criteria for some sort of degree from high school. Um, so really just have to now be able to follow the student code of conduct that any student on campus has to follow and then have that designation of an short of all Okay. Are there also program specific, are there also program specific courses or are all courses audited and are they graded in order to measure SAP? Um, so there are some classes that we we gear the student towards if they're not sure what they want to do as far as a career one day. Um, but for those who do, we start right in with uh, maybe the intro. Uh, like if a uh, student wanted to go into culinary arts, then we have seven courses. The department said, hey, these are seven courses that the students need. This first course gets them their safe serve certification that they would need if they moved anywhere in the country to work in a restaurant. So that's the first class we think they should take. So we kind of go by with the department what they feel is recommended. Um, and then with that designation of the uh, comprehensive uh, transition program, we have uh, developed our academic the yearly progress so the students are meeting that since they are not receiving a grade for the class officially. Okay. How much ongoing contact does the program have with parents and guardians? Um, a good amount. Um, you know, we work with uh, the parents day one, you know, in our first interview with them as far as what the expectation is the students and them. And then during orientation, we also have a session time for parents to be able to come. Because I mentioned earlier that, you know, a lot of times they've been the biggest advocate and they've been fighting for everything the student may have needs through K-12 as well as uh, at their home in the community um, to be able to help them say, you know, that's still there, but this is the way you have to do it now. You can't just call a professor, email you know, a professor and say, why did you give, you know, Johnny this grade? Right. And, you know, there's, we go over the FERPA with them and then how to help them, uh, you know, and those who, who aren't sure that they are able to give up that, uh, you know, need to do this, we really help them work maybe with other parents to say, hey, can you, you know, we want to start this group so that parents can have a better understanding of what they're, you know, how they can best support their student on campus, just like any student. And so that's helped kind of lead them down the right direction as far as knowing how much they can give uh, as far as involvement. Okay, all right. 
It appears as, as if you've experienced stable staff over the years. What types of transition planning are you doing? Uh, I so guess that's asking for a staff, you know, looking at staff in the future. Um, well, we've been able to use a lot more student volunteers this year. Um, and so what we're trying to do is break down each of the different uh, roles and responsibilities that the main the leadership team that we have and then how those are being met. And then can some of those duties or activities be uh, given to somebody else? And so that's how we kind of determine, you know, the need for the graduate assistant or uh, some of the different student volunteers we have, uh, you know, they might be somebody in social work, it might be somebody in, in education or public health and they uh, wanna do internships. So we, other departments are contacting us for students who need internships. And so they're fulfilling a lot of the responsibilities as well too, which has been incredibly helpful. Um, you know, we've had some different uh, organizations contact us that wanna be involved. And so uh, we've helped kind of have a, maybe a student intern take that responsibility over and then are updating us on how we need to proceed. So that's helped a lot too, is to work with volunteers. Um, but we we know we're eventually gonna need to hire more staff if we decide to allow more students in the, in the program. Great. Bud, we really wanna thank you for your time this morning for providing so much information in our general session about inclusive you at Syracuse University. And um, 